I'm going to speak tonight about what I call the question of solace. And it's a question that, as of now, is an open question in the theology I'm trying to present. What I'm trying to present is a theology based on reason and fact and evidence and rationality. And before I get into the question of solace, I want to make another comment. If people see these videos I've made, I expect a few of them will want to converse with me, argue with me, perhaps. And I'm open to doing that with the right kind of person. The wrong kind of person is someone who's, who's so invested in their belief that they're not open to changing their mind. I've spoken with believers in the past, and sometimes in a conversation like that, you make point after point, and you feel like you're making headway, and you feel like you've proven your point. And you reach the end, and they accept, well, that certainly seems right, and they have nothing to say against it, except then they say, but I have faith. You haven't really changed their mind. You've spent all, all that time, and they play the faith trump card, and it's over. You've lost. They were trying to change your mind, but they were not open to their mind being changed. And that's, that's kind of unfair. So I wouldn't want to have dialogue with people who I believe are like that, because I think it'd be a waste of time. There's a rather famous philosopher who I think is like that, and I'll show you why. His name is William Lane Craig, and he's a, one of the foremost Christian apologists that I know of. And this magazine here seems to agree. It calls him uh, Christianity's boldest apostle. It really, he's really an apologist. He tries to explain and make reasonable Christian beliefs. And Dr. Craig has, in the past, said that his he knows Christianity is true, Christianity is true, based on the witness of the Holy Spirit in his heart, which is self-authenticating, wholly apart from the evidence. So, there's someone I would not want to have a dialogue with, because I don't think they're open to changing their mind. And to show you the extent of uh, his belief, his self-authenticating belief, he um, talks about how God ordered the Hebrews to kill all the Canaanite men, women, and children. And then he goes on to justify it. It's a long article, and there's the link. But he decides that the slaughter of those children was a good thing. It, it ensured their salvation. Okay, now, someone who has given their mind over to some belief that is beyond question because it's self the belief is self-authenticating in their mind kind of scares me in a way. Now, th that's the mindset, I believe, of the suicide bomber. Now, not that Dr. Craig is a suicide bomber, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that that same mindset of invulnerability to facts and evidence, the, the mindset that I know I'm right no matter what, is what this man is uh, called Son of Sam. He was a a murderer in the 1970s, I believe, and he believed that God was directing him to do his, his, his uh, murders. So it seems to me that once you reach a point where you have a belief that just you're never going to give up, it's as if you've turned off a part of your brain. That's the way it seems to me. There's an idea, which is controversial, called meme, and a meme is kind of like a mental virus. The idea is that some beliefs can attach themselves to human hosts and ingrain themselves so deeply that they're invulnerable to reason or argument. So, let's get now on to the question of solace. What could, based on the theology I've developed so far, what could I say to a person who is in deep grief? A mother who's lost her child, let's say. And from what I've said so far, I don't know if, if what I had to say would be adequate. In this clip, I spoke about our place and time. Humanity itself has existed 100, 200,000 years. That's not much in the lifetime of the universe so far. Our place in space, there are literally more stars in the universe than more grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. 
And most of those stars that we know of have planets. We're a very, very, very tiny part of the universe. And even on Earth, seven plus billion people, and I'm just one of them. So that's what I've talked about so far, our, our place in space and time and on the Earth. And I had this. We were just a speck on a speck. Now, this is not going to be very comforting to someone who's in deep grief, right? Further, in this uh, video clip, I talked about how gods who are persons, if they exist, are still creatures. And I drew a, a parallel between Jesus and Santa Claus. Not very comforting. Someone who's lost a child probably wants to hear that that child is in heaven, and they're with God, and God has a plan, and it's all okay, even though there's a lot of pain right now. And I don't know if I can say that. In this clip, I talked about what happens after death, and I got into the question of identity. And do we have an enduring identity? Now, it could be that when we analyze ourselves, we feel that our identity, our identity is our consciousness. That's the thing that doesn't change. That's the thing that was there at birth, not the body, not this mind, at least not in its present form. But if consciousness is the same for everyone, then the Buddhist idea that we don't have an enduring deep identity applies, that we're just an aggregate. We just combination that when it goes, it, it, it's over. Another way I expressed our uh, our identity is we're a wave on the ocean. The ocean is real. The wave comes and goes. We're something that the ultimate ground of existence is playing, like an actor plays Hamlet. So we have an identity, and a natural, you know, conventional identity, but maybe not a deep, eternal identity. Now, I don't think any of that stuff would be comforting. I think that someone in this situation would want to hear that their loved one is, is in heaven and going to live forever and they'll soon be joining them and that there's a God who is a person who is wise and just and has done this for reasons they can't understand but and this is a question it's a question that as of now is an open question I have some ideas how it might be answered but none that I want to present now because I, I'm not sure of them I will say however though that I did mention how there are four parts of a human being. This was in a, another clip and how some people are more physical. That's what the, the uh, line represents. I'm sorry, the ox represents the physical. The line represents the emotional, like a roaring line. The eagle represents the intellect. And the angel or the man represents the soul. And the idea is that some people are more physical. Some people are more emotion, heart-centered. Heart some people are more intellectual. The soul, the consciousness, these are parts of human being. But the point is that this natural theology might be only appealing to some people, maybe a small part of humanity, if you know, if at all. And that so far, I don't have much, much to offer in the way of comfort and solace to someone who is experiencing grief. Now, I did say at least twice before that we're kind of like pioneers. We're, we're out in in a way, uncharted territory, and at least I am, and I'm trying to find my way. And maybe there is an answer to this question of souls in, in natural philosophy, and maybe I just haven't found it yet. But I just want to acknowledge that there are questions that I would like to, to discuss and, and um, explore if anyone has any good answers or good ideas. And that's about all I wanted to say for tonight, so thank you.